Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to everyone here this morning, and happy Father's Day to everyone in person and watching us online. As we remember and honor our fathers today, I'd like to share a quote from Billy Graham, who said, A good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, and unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. May we praise and honor our fathers always with the love they deserve. I hope and pray that the Lord has blessed you and kept you well this past week. Let us enter his gates with thanksgiving and his court with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. May grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father be with you all. Next Sunday will be our last service together. And so we're hoping that we have many people here. And many of you will be going to Leon's after worship for a farewell lunch. And as an alternative to Leon's, we're also having a special fellowship hour in the Mayflower Room immediately following worship. For those who don't feel comfortable eating at Leon's due to COVID concerns, there'll be some special refreshments along with pictures and items on display from years past. There'll be a time for fellowship and memories for everyone who would like to join us. Feel free to attend both if you'd like to stop by the Mayflower Room and have a cup of coffee and visit with us before you head on over to Leon's, please do so. Thank you to all our members and friends who participated in the Kroger Community Rewards Program. Um, and please be sure to change your charitable donation from the church to another uh, nonprofit organization since we will no longer be receiving checks from Kroger. And please see the bulletin to find a link in order to make that change. And this also applies to those who participated in the Amazon Smile program. We will continue to collect food and personal items for Downriver for veterans in Wyandot until next Friday, June 24th. That will be the day of our last delivery to them. And as always, thank you to all of you who have continued to make contributions to the veterans over these past several years. And the flowers, the altar flowers this morning are from Susan and Isabel Hutton in honor of Reverend Ernie Klein and Irene Moxon. And now let us worship.
Please stand for the call to worship. What brings us joy? What, what slows us down? down? What gives us hope? What, what makes us think? What invites us to wonder? What, what makes us change? Might it have something to do with the holy? Let, Let us worship God. so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love I reprove and discipline so be zealous and repent behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come into him and eat with him 
and he with me. Our second reading comes from Colossians 4, 16 through 18. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laotians, and see that you can also read the letter from La Laot <laughs> Laotia. And say to Archippus, see that, see that you will fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. This is the word of God for the people. church 
we would talk almost every day. And um, I picked that picture up today. And then <laughs> you guys have the flowers in memory of her today. So I told them some of them I cry easily, <laughs> you know. Um, so I'm sentimental about this sermon because it's goodbye Colossians, and we didn't, we just said hello. <laughs> you know, we haven't had that much time to spend, but we have spent about six weeks in Colossians, and I wanted to remind you why I chose this book. I chose this book because it contains some of the most glorious passages about Christ in all the Bible. I chose this book because it it. Uh, it has the image of a diamond from the writings of Paul um, about the descriptions of Jesus. And I chose this book because I felt if we went through the whole thing, you would love Jesus more. And that was my goal, that you would see him clearer and you would love him more. So today we say goodbye to Colossae. <laughs> Final words. <clears throat> Paul, it doesn't end with the usual Paul. Right. Paul usually at the end of his books gives this long winded uh, ending. Very colorful, very articulate. Today is very simple. It doesn't end with a crescendo or a bang. Rather, this glorious book ends with personal and heartfelt words from a pastor who loves their people. For Paul, the issues that he has talked about throughout the book are directly referred to people that are no longer in a, that are no longer in his heart. In other words, the centrality and supremacy of Jesus is important because it's personal. Christology, that's a big name for you. It's the study of Christ is a personal study. So he says to the church in verse 16, he says, the letter that this letter to Laodicea, which was 10 miles west of Colossae, should be read at Laodicea. And the church in Laodicea is mentioned in our second uh, scripture today. And um, <laughs> when all this was first starting with this church and we decided to close, I was very angry. I wasn't angry with anybody in this room. I was angry with the denomination because the denomination failed, as most denominations have failed, in, starting in the 1980s because people stopped looking for churches based on their denomina denomination affiliation. So churches were no longer fed by people moving to Dearborn and saying, oh, I went to the Congregational Church in Kalamazoo, and so therefore I looked up the Congregational Church. It's not happening anymore. People were looking for churches based on their spirituality and on what they had to offer, maybe their children or for whatever reason. But the denominational uh, partisanship no longer exists. We know that because we closed uh, almost 14,000 churches last year. The United Church of Christ um, has lost 40% uh, of their churches uh, up until 2017, prior to COVID. Imagine what the numbers are now. I know several myself that have closed just in our area. I was mad at the denomination, and I was mad at some of the former ministers here because I didn't feel like they led the people very well. Not all of them, some were great, some were terrific. But I was angry with them. Uh, most uh, have gone on their way, and I thought they did terrible damage to this congregation. And I was angry with myself, because I thought you were here for almost 24 years, old, and you didn't make enough difference to have a group of people survive. So, I kept thinking about what I was going to preach on the last Sunday, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to let them have it. I am just going to let them have it. And I'm going to pick this scripture from Revelation, where Jesus stood at the door and knocked and knocked and knocked, and nobody answered. Nobody answered. He stood at the door and knocked about the, the church of Laodicea. And then I came to grips with myself and, you know, I started saying, this isn't anybody who's going to be in that service's fault. Why are you going to let them have it? And not <laughs> any of those ministers going to be there. Not one soul from denominationalism. And plus, nobody cares about your bully pulpit view of denominationalism versus, you know, uh, biblical Christianity anyway. So just shut up and give a nice service. <laughs> so that's what I decided to do. 
So for this Sunday, I thought, what am I going to do? We're not through Colossians yet. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to go to the very last few verses of Colossians, and that'll be my sermon. <laughs> Laodicea. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. <laughs> it's my original text. <laughs> so but I'm not going to let you have it today. But I am going to point some things out, because Paul says that the letter should be read at Laodicea, which was 10 miles west of Colossae. And the church, again, is read, is, is, this is this Revelation church, where it says, I know your works, for you're neither hot nor cold. Now, he's not saying that hot or cold is bad, because sometimes you've got to be hot, sometimes you've got to be cold. On a really hot day, do you want to drink hot tea? No. On a really cold day, do you want to drink, uh, you know, a cold Diet Coke? No. Hot or cold is not bad. What's bad is lukewarm. Anybody who has gone to college and eaten day after day in a cafeteria knows what it's like to eat lukewarm food. Because by the time you wait in line, by the time you get your silverware, by the time you make your salad, by the time you hit the ice cream bar, not me. But by the time you do all that and get it back, your food is lukewarm. So four years in college cured me of always wanting my food piping hot. I want my food hot because lukewarm doesn't serve any purpose. So what he was saying about this church in Laodicea is they had lost their usefulness. They were lukewarm. And he says, if you're neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. He will snuff out, another verse says, he will snuff out the candlestick of that church. And he did. And he says, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. They were self-deceived. Friends, we were self-deceived, and I was part of it. We had a lot going on here. We had money. We had things going on, but there was a lack of spirituality. There was a lack of Jesus being the central. And what happens is you get a couple of leaders. <clears throat> what happens specifically, specifically, I think, with congregations, not necessarily this one, is people have too much dependency on the pastor as their leader. So the pastor does all the spiritual work, and the people do all the physical work. So in other words... You know, we make sure that the grounds are kept up. We make sure that we have fellowship. We make sure, you know, all, all these things are right and good things. But when the focus becomes on, um, and I don't want to pick on anything specific, but like, you know, we, we spent so much energy on the rummage sale and so many energy on the Christmas tree lot. And again, none of that was wrong, but we sort of lost the spiritual focus of the church or we left it totally to the minister. And then we showed up on Sunday just to be fed. And it weakened the congregation. The congregation became weaker and weaker and weaker. And it became easier and easier for people not to come to church. So attendance started to suffer, as did um, profits. And so I think the church was in a self-deceptive state for a long time. And then when it got to be crucial, there were some in this room that tried so hard and worked so hard. Too hot. <laughs> some of us worked too hard. To, to save this church. But it reminds me of this, because in verse 18 he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be jealous, zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Here this church in Laodicea is playing church. And Jesus is standing at the door. Hello, let me in, let me in, let me in. And they play church and they play church and they play church. And finally he said, I will spew you out of your mouth. And the church is listed in one of the 12 or seven churches uh, in uh, Asia. And the church was eventually closed. The church is rebuked for its lack of usefulness, its pride, and its exclusion of Christ in the midst of their century, uh, in the midst of their assembly. Uh, when Jesus, when Jesus is not central or supreme or the core of Christians personally, then you become lukewarm. So, Archippus, this is the question for today. The letter said, Archippus, fulfill your ministry. We don't know a lot about Archippus. We think he's the son of Philemon. Because in Philemon, it says, To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, 
and the church in your house. But apparently Archippus had some important thing he did in the church. He had some important ministry. We don't know what it was, but Paul said, you need to fulfill your ministry. So the question I have for you today is, we're only closing a building. The church of Jesus Christ still moves on. Just the building is closed. You will find another group of people to worship with. Have you fulfilled your ministry? Have you identified your ministry? <clears throat> Do you know what your ministry is? So when you leave this place of worship and go to another place of worship, I want you to ask yourself, what is your ministry? And I have fulfilled it. I don't care how old you are or how infirm you are. There's something that God has planned for you, every one of us. And we all have gifts that equip us to look at. Marilyn Beardsley is in a wheelchair and had been very sick for years and years and years. And she still sends out cards to people who are, um, are ill. So as we bring this series of Colossians to a close, it, it reminds me of the personal words of Paul here, who he says, To my dear people, don't forget me or God's grace. It's very personal, this verse for 18. He says, don't forget me or God's grace. It's written by Paul himself, and you feel the personal nature of this passage. It may not have even been his hand, the hand that, it may have been that the hand that wrote this was actually chained because Paul was in prison when he wrote it. It's not far after this that Paul writes to Timothy, come before winter, bring my coat. It's stunning and emotional to hear what Paul says, remember my chains. The implication is that Paul wanted them to not forget why he was in prison. It seems that Paul wanted to be sure that his ministry to them was not a waste or as if he needed to know that his imprisonment was not creating an out of sight, out of mind mentality. Do you hear the personal nature of this appeal? It is moving to see the humanity of the beloved <clears throat> Apostle Paul. It reminds me that ministry is deeply personal and that's the way it should be. Even entrusted with this few groups that I have had in the last year and a half, Preaching is, the, out of these series has helped me tremendously in my day-to-day -day behaviors and how I think of God and everything else. And it's, it's true, the more you invest yourself into ministry, the more personal it comes. In Thessalonians 2.7, Paul describes his care for the church like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And that's why John, in the third chapter, John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And Paul pleads with them, don't forget me and my chains. He wants their prayers, their love, and their allegiance. Maybe that's what Paul just wanted to be sure that the ministry would continue. Today, as we come close to the final chapter in this church's history, in this fellowship, this dance, don't forget the chains. Don't forget the grace to which you are entrusted. Finally, the book closes with a statement that we find in other books of the Bible. Grace be with you. This translation, you have to look at the Greek here. Grace be with you. There is no be. It just says grace with you. Grace with you. Wherever you go from this building, grace is with you. And you need to act and extend that grace as you have been graced. He is saying here, God's grace will sustain the community, for it is by grace alone that they will stand. So he is certainly wishing something for them. Romans chapter 5, 1, 3 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace through God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we access by faith unto his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So Paul's heart for these Colossian believers is they would not soon forget evident grace of God in their midst. He wants them to stand in the grace that they've been given us. And that's my uh, plea to you today that you stand in grace when you leave this building and go to worship someplace else. So there's seven lessons in Colossians. I'll read through them quickly. Number one, Jesus is the core. You remember that sermon? We don't make him the core. He is the core, so deal with it. <laughs> For by all things, 
we were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities, all things were created through him and for him. For he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he's the head of the body, the church, he's the beginning, he's the firstborn of the dead, and that in everything he is preeminent. There's nothing that Jesus can't handle, number two. Jesus can. Just do it doesn't work. I want you to be a Jesus can people, no matter what your challenge is. I'm an awful sinner, and I could never pay for my sins. Jesus can. I've made such a mess of my life, I can't fix what I've done, but Jesus can. I've been so hurt, I don't have the power or even thought of loving them, let alone forgive them. I can't create love for them. But I have a friend with deep, deep problems. I don't know what to say. I can't. I'm uncomfortable talking to them. Jesus can. Our son won't listen to us. His heart is hard. We can't get through it. Oh, Jesus can. My life is too painful to be real. I cannot do this again, but Jesus can. I'm so confused. My promises are so complicated and challenging. I can't figure out what to do. Jesus can. I can't find a church that I like. Jesus can. Number three, when we suffer, we make the word heard. Colossians verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am willing to, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. God intends for the afflictions of Christ to be presented to the world through the afflictions of his people. We went through Philippians. We talked about the opportunity that suffering gives us to witness to the world. That when we're suffering, the world can look at us and say, my gosh, he died of cancer and he died with a joyful spirit, not embittered towards God. And there's no testimony that's stronger than that kind of death. During the series on Colossians, we said goodbye to four, uh, to uh, some chapters that made the word heard. Man, number four, man-made rules don't work. So Brian's problem is Brian's problem. Brian wants to be the core of everything. Brian Samson wants the universe to revolve around him. <laughs> We try in our power to be moral. We try in our own power to make the church pure. Both our failures to trust God, both our both both our failures to trust God and His power. But we need to hear the scary truth of Colossians 2:23. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. The devil does not care if he can destroy you with godless sensuality or godless spirituality. All he cares about is that it is godless. But the problem, the frightening problem with godless spirituality is that those guilty of it feel spiritual. A sensual man feels guilty. A spiritually proud man feels religious. Do you know what that means? That means there are those that come and sit in pews that are actors. It's not true. They go to church their whole lives, never really making Jesus the core of their lives. Number five, we live vicariously through Christ. Vicarious living means that we live through another, and we need to live through our position in Christ. Colossians 2, 11, 12, we didn't get to this one. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised through him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Over and over in the book of Romans, the book of Colossians, and the book of Acts, we see this word buried in baptism. And I bring this up because I come from a tradition where we keep the symbols that Jesus taught in the New Testament accurate. For instance, we take unleavened bread for communion because that's what it was. We drink of the fruit of the vine because that's what it was. We also baptize by immersion because it is a symbol of being buried with Christ as Christ was buried in his resurrection, up from the water and hands crossed just as you would be in a coffin, buried dead up to a newness of life. You will never feel cleaner. That is 
what the word means. Baptisto means to be immersed. Christening or sprinkling was brought in 400 years after the early church. And it was, it was brought in by uh, Augustine, who came up with the uh, doctrine of original sin, that babies are born sinful, and that if you baptize them right away, they'll go to heaven. In fact, I know some Catholics that are worried about taking their baby home from the hospital, or they won't take the baby out of the, out of the house because they fear that the baby will go to hell. This is, my friends, this is not biblical. It is not what the Bible teaches. It is not part of the kingdom of God. Baptism is a symbol of death to our old self to walk in the newness of life. Number six, we mortify sin through intentional atrophy. We exercise our spiritual muscles when we say no to sin. So if you have a sin that you've dealt with, an addiction or something that's gone on and on, maybe it's a filthy mouth, maybe it's who knows what it is, and you start saying no, it's like any habit. You are exercising your spiritual muscles and you are attacking the atrophy of not trying. And number seven, bring Jesus into your marriage, your family, and work. Colossians, the part that we missed, tells wives to be submissive, husbands to love their wives, children to obey their parents, slaves to be submissive to their masters, and that masters are to be fair and just. Let me put that in today's language. Husbands are to love their wives and to be the authority figures in the family. Children are to obey their parents. Bosses, workers, are to be submissive to their bosses. And bosses are commanded to be fair and just. So, so counterintuitive to our society today. Children I see daily disobeying their parents. Workers have an attitude against their bosses most of the time. Husbands oftentimes don't love their wives. And, and wives oftentimes don't submit to the authority. And it, it has nothing to do with, with honor. It's the, it's the chain of authority that God has commanded us in this book of Colossians. God is the Godhead. Jesus is the authority over the church. Men are to be submissive to and women are to be submissive to Jesus. Men are the authority in the family and are to love their family. So, and it, it's a chain of command that goes down. There's, and I, I hope they hear me all over the world. That's our seven lessons that we ought never forget. I challenge you this morning as we close, read the book of Colossians. And I guarantee you will love Jesus more and more and more and more. There's only him that we sing more about Jesus I would know. And I believe that if you would continue to this book, that you will love Jesus more and you'll find a relationship with, with him. The concept of Jesus being the core is a powerful, life-changing idea. And so as we bid farewell to this glorious book with a gratitude for what God has taught us, I trust a deep resolve to discover for the rest of our lives what it means for Jesus to be preeminent one. Amen.
Our Father and our God, we're thankful for your word. We pray for each member of this congregation as we just fellowship together that we would become approved unto you through the study of your word. We pray that each one here today will leave this service with a desire to make you the core of their lives, who they are, the layers and the onion. Lord, we're thankful for your grace. And we're thankful that we're called to stand in your grace. We're thankful for the Apostle Paul who wrote such personal, heartfelt things that we still study today. We're thankful for his inspiration. We're thankful for the inspiration of those in this congregation who have gone on before us. Today, we petition you for those in our congregation who are hurting, whether physically, emotionally, or spiritually. We pray for those who have cancer, for those who have COVID, for those who are suffering from this physical world of cause and effect, car accidents, those who are aged and shut in, we pray for. We pray that those who are on our prayer list today will preach your word through their suffering and live their lives in the light of you despite their troubles. And we pray that for each one in our midst today. Lord, we pray that each one will leave this church and fulfill their ministry in another place. Not another church, same church, different building. Because we know the thing that you talked about most here on earth was the kingdom of God and your bride, the church. And we know that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So as we continue in worship of you, we're thankful and we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just one. Well, <laughs> 
make us one, Lord. Make us one. Thank <laughs> you.